So let's consider the thing that I want to talk about today, generic defects in pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. When the child is born with, you know, uh, defect, we wouldn't know what defect is there. But because glucose, glucose is converted to pyruvate and pyruvate normally gets in the mitochondria and converted to acetyl-CoA by PDC, when this enzyme is defective, the pyruvate accumulates in the cytoplasm and converted into lactate, and the lactate is what causes the problem. So you want baby uh, non, uh, looking, you know, relatively a normal uh, outcome of delivery is sent home, and within a week or two, the mother brings it back because the child has trouble breathing. The lactic acid now has accumulated in the blood, pH has dropped, and there's a breathing problem. And this is what is called a lactic acidosis. So the first primary indication clinically is lactic acidosis. And lactic acidosis can occur with a number of other genetic defects. Any defect in the TCS cycle or fatty acid oxidation, when NADH changes in the mitochondria and increases, that back regulates the pyruvate metabolism and lactate formation. So there are various different you know, tests that one can do and we develop you know number of tests to measure you know the cause of lactic acidosis some 30 years back and you know one of the enzymes that was defective was shown to be PDC. So this is the you know reaction that the pyruvate cannot be oxidized, so it accumulates uh, in the lactate form. So the question is you know what happens. So here is the component that I just talked about the PDC. There are various different components. And alpha has alpha and beta, two different proteins. E1 has, you know, all of us are the single gene products. And collectively, this number, you know, slide is very old. Some time back, it was 130 patients have been reported with the alpha uh, defect in the alpha gene. Now there are about 350 reported uh, in the recent review. And these are the reported cases, the cases that have been treated and not reported is a very large number. So it is not so common. Any defect in the mitochondrial metabolism, PDC is the highest you know, number that shows the genetic defects in the PDC components. All of these genes have been shown to be you know, somehow modified except the kinases because kinases would not cause any problem in glucose metabolism. So that there are no reported genetic defects so far in PDK. But more importantly, as you can see from this number, this one gene, alpha gene, E1 alpha protein, and PDH A1 alpha gene is the one, the site where the most genetic defects are there. And this gene is located on X chromosome, so that is very good. That we have two gene copies. One is the copy located on the X chromosome, which is on the somatic cells and expressed in all cells. But for that reason, being X, the you know cells for the spermatogenesis would not have the PDX, and would, some will have only one copy, others would not have. So when the mutation occurs, that would be devastating. So nature has provided copy this gene in a pseudo gene process, in a process gene without any intron, and this gene is located on the chromosome four and that is specific only for the testicular cell and you know given an alternative way to have the function for the PDA. So one that I'm going to describe is the gene defects in this particular gene located on the X chromosome and that is expressed in most somatic cells. And if we have defect in the E1 component which is the major site the next you know gene that is affected is E3 and as you can see that there are a number of you know, presentations of what clinically one finds in patients depending upon the degree of defect in this particular gene expressions. Delayed growth, developmental seizures, CNS degenerations, that is also some of the patients who are identified as Lay's disease also have the PDC deficiency to some CNS malformations and many other things. And many of these uh, patients die at very early age. Severe the complications, few days, months, years. Now that we have you know, treatment and early diagnosis, so the treatment can be initiated very early. They are you know, uh, living longer, but they still have 
great deal of you know, cerebral abnormality as, uh, as I will show you. So here we start after cloning all the human genes, we started you know, cDNA sequences of the, uh, coming from the patient population and showed that you know, there are three different things as shown over here in the immunoblocks presentation or the uh, RNA blocks in the northern blocks in the 80s and 90s, you know, we used to do it. So there are three kinds of presentations. That number of cases when we reported in 1988, they do not have much activity. That's the cause of the deficiency. 5% of the activity or 10%, but basically it's very low or absence of activity. And the question of absence of activity is because of what? Is protein is there or not? I put it protein there. Protein is malformed or mutated, so it doesn't have activity, but the protein is there. And sometimes the uh, activity is, uh, protein is there, uh, uh, but there's no, uh, is, you know, a counterpart which is a better protein. So as you can see over here, that in this case, they, there's no activity, but there are some subjects have both alpha and beta protein and they have both alpha and beta messenger RNA, but there is no activity. That's the catalytic mutant. Protein is there, but catalytically it's not functional. In other cases of uh, patients, there is no protein at all. The messages are there, both alpha and beta, and the, but the both alpha and beta proteins are missing. And the question is, well, defect is only in one gene, why two proteins are missing? And they, you know, we showed later on that when alpha is not there, the beta is synthesized from the beta messenger RNA, but it by itself is not stable. It doesn't have a partner to make the alpha to beta to structure for the even component, and so it also being degraded. And uh, in other cases, alpha even message is missing. Generic defect it says that there is no message transcribed, and so the, there is no alpha message. There is no alpha protein. The beta message is there, but there is no beta protein because this interaction is required for between the two proteins. So there are a number of ways, then we went on to show the actual genetic defects at the DNA level. Which nucleotide was changed that causes this you know, particular defect. And as you can see over here in the normal subject, there's only one C, while in the uh, mutant, uh, there are, you know, uh, 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 instead of there's nothing here, then appear one over here, that's, you know, the two cells. So, so that just transfer or the mutation is single base mutations can cause, you know, a large number of, you know, changes in the physical activity. And we have recorded, other also recorded, and as you can see on the next slide, even this is the old slide, there are so many things that have been changed. There's a frame shift, missense mutations, deletion, insertion, and so that, uh, initially thought that since it is on the X chromosome, males would be the predominant, but that is not the case. Females have two Xs, and out of two only one gets mutated, but the X in the activation is random. So that even if the uh, you know, uh, correct copy gets inactivated, then they have genetic defect, because the mutated uh, gene is not functional. So that there are a number of, you know, Females, as you can see over here on the upper side, they have also shown. Initially, most of the <coughs> identified mutations were within a small locations so around here. So there was a you know, general feeling that there was a hot spot. But as more and more patients now have been you know, reported, it looks like that's really not the case. It's all over the gene, and now many more uh, subjects have been identified. So that uh, in terms of its activation, Further later on, we uh, took the human protein and in collaboration with a person from Poland. Isn't that interesting? Uh, but there was one of our colleagues at the university, uh, was a crystallographer, so we got the protein structures. And then we uh, can now go back and see which amino acid that is being you know, mutated and how that uh, really impacts on the function of the protein. So we take the genetic information, mutation information, back to the biochemistry lab and we really understand how that really mutation affects the function at the cellular level. 
as you can see here, this is one of the active sites in the alpha, where the thiamine pyrophosphate is the cofactor that binds, and so there are any mutations, especially this P188 is the one that brings this thing closer to the active sites, and uh, another one is the methionine, and any mutations in these two positions are very detrimental to the function of the enzyme or its role in the catalytic activity and binding of the thiamine pyrophosphate. So we identified and explained what was the you know, biochemical basis for the uh, loss of activity. Now, more recent study, uh, this is not me, this is uh, another investigator by the same name, Patel is a sort of very common name in, in a certain part of India, and this review came in uh, 2012, and as you can see, that time they identified 294 patients. So this number has even gone higher than that. And as you can see here, that many of the patients who are alive slowly decreases. Many of them die off, but some of them are now taken away from the research you know, investigation so that there are no available drugs. And as you can see here, that death and survival is, you know, uh, relatively, you know, extended in terms of months, years. Uh, but uh, as you can see here, that since 187 patients are identified by actually molecular and genetic defect that just are identified by sequencing that cDNA. As one can see here, th there are three things that have been reported in this review. Are the, these three sites uh, in the cDNA which are much more common. And as you can see here, the patients with three or two mutations, they have died very early in the live thing. So the type of mutation or the site of mutation also contributes to the overall survival because of the lack of functions. And the kinds of changes that have been reported, not all patients have been studied uh, very extensively, and especially not at the uh, cerebral level, the brain level. Some of these autopsy specimens have been obtained and uh, reported, but much of things is, you know, information is never gathered in terms of for analysis. And as one can see here, that in terms of most of the things, even alpha mutations is the one that is predominant, as you can see in this green color. And kinds of, you know, the defect that one sees or reported observations in the brain, malformations and functions are listed over here. And this is, you know, very interesting in terms of, you know, analyzing what's going on. So the question is, you know, this is the general practice in terms of showing understanding of the PDC function mutations and the clinical observations. So the question, how do we treat these patients? And of course, the first thing comes to mind is that, well, they cannot oxidize glucose, so give an alternate substance, which is fatty acids. So if you give fat, fat is converted into ketone bodies by the liver, and then ketone bodies can be taken up by the brain. Fat, fatty acids cannot be oxidized by the brain because of the transport limitation, but water-soluble ketone bodies can be taken up by the brain. So one of the you know, most standard uh, practice is always to give them you know, uh, uh, ketogenic diets. The one other thing, as I mentioned, that in this enzyme, there are five coenzymes are involved. I didn't really show you all five, but Thiamine pyrophosphate is the first, you know, uh, coenzyme involved in the even a uh, catalytic reaction. So the you know common practice is to give large amount of coenzyme forms or the enzyme uh, vitamins like thiamine, riboflavin, lipoic acid coenzyme Q, and anything that is available, and it's uh, hoping that it will do some good. Sometimes it does because the catalytic mutation is where the thiamine pyrophosphate binding site is that, then that is, would be called thiamine responsive genetic defect. But most patients don't really have that defect. So, but the practice is that, that it is so simple to do it. So most patients are given at least one or more vitamins on a mega doses. The third one is that uh, when the enzyme defect is there, there is a residual amount of activities left behind. They are not completely zero activity. Zero activity PDC is not compatible with life. As I will show you in the 
uh, mouse data. If you have no PDC activity, then it, it, it would not survive one in utero. So when the patient is born, it's always some sort of a low activity, anywhere from 5 to 30 percent of the residual activity, patient is able to survive, develop, and then eventually, you know, either survive or die out in the postnatal period. So that activity is there, it's, you know, so if activity is there, if that activity is also, at some portion of that is in the active form, the remaining activity is in inactive form. So if we convert inactive form back into active form, then we get some benefits, additional benefits. And for that thing, we can inhibit the kinase. So the inhibition of, you know, kinase is an important treatment. One of the known inhibitors is dichloroacetate, but dichloroacetate is shown to be toxic in human. You can give it for a short time. A week, two weeks, four weeks, low dose is fine. But for a growing child, give for months and months and years, that is not possible because that really gets converted into dichloroacetylcholine and gets integrated into all kinds of uh, products in the uh, body and then eventually it has been a high toxicity. And so the more recently, the, some other compounds have been shown like phenylbutyrate and many others. And I think this is the one that we recently started after Clay's work came and then she initiated this project and that's, you know, uh, I've done some extensive studies both in Buffalo and now over here and she tells me that there are some very interesting findings and maybe sometime she, she will have a chance to tell you the new story, you know, how this thing has really developed in terms of uh, development of a new treatment. But let's understand how these things are working in human thing. So if you give high fat diet, ketone bodies are generated by the liver, the brain takes it up and instead of utilizing glucose that cannot be done, so the acetyl CoA comes from the ketone body and the brain gets a little better. So those children are given high fat diet soon after birth, they will get better. Even though they are not treated at all by dietary means. And so here is the one study showing that if the, at one year of age before treatment, myelination at the level of six months, there were all kinds of changes that have been shown by the symmetrical area increase with signal density in various part of the brain here. But if the same child was you know, given the, the high fat diet for one year, then many of these things are slowly disappearing. So that's getting some benefits of the treatment of the high fat diet. Here is a colleague of mine in Cleveland when we were studying all these other patients. They, we identified four patients here and with two genetic defects. So the genetic defects is known here at, you know, uh, at the level of you know, nucleotide 349 and 234. So uh, three patients here and four patients here. One of the group was sibling. And all these patients were then placed on the high fat diet, but at a different time period. Okay, this was just a study. Whenever you identify a patient comes to your clinic, then this is where the treatment starts. And the overall, I think, you know, or summary of this, you know, study that is done for, uh, you know, very, uh, at least 40 months or so, one can say that uh, subject who either had the diets initiated earlier in life, or those who were placed on a greater carbohydrate restriction, we really don't have to eat carbohydrate. The carbohydrate we eat, we like it. Uh, it's taste, sweet taste, cheapest source of energy in our dietary daily component, but it's not a required component in the diet. So these children have shown that they have gotten uh, no carbohydrate for months and months. And actually they do better, do far better than those, you know, getting the carbohydrate. So, uh, earlier you start the carbohydrate, uh, no carbohydrate treatment or high fat diet, they do better because the lactate comes down and the ketone body level goes up and the brain is able to uh, oxidize, metabolize ketone body and actually do that. So the treatment, start of the treatment and the restriction of the carbohydrate in your dietary treatments are the two positive factors for better outcome in the clinical situation. Okay, so so far the you know human stems. 
uh, we can't really understand what's going on in the human brain during the development, especially with PDC deficiency. So we develop a mouse model, knockout mouse model, that you know we can study what its impact is on the brain development. So here is the human gene, and we also added, you know, uh, isolated murine gene, which is very similar to human gene in its, you know, uh, 11 uh, axons. And then we modified in a way, without going into great detail, that we put some markers, you know, around the axon 8. And then we took out this, uh, you know, uh, report of genes away. And so you will have the system which looks like this. That th there are markers, and these markers are the one which can be, you know, uh, cleared up by the Cree protein expression. So when you express Cree, the, they cut out around the exon 8, and the exon 8 is gone, but then they just ligate it. So now here is the uh, uh, gene that is now modified without exon 8. That's the mutation. So whenever we express the tree, so we develop a mouse mo a line which is, you know, has uh, this extended sequences, but it's not detrimental. And so this is what we call Fox animal. They are Fox with these sequences. And then when we breed the female, Fox female with the transgenic mouse expressing Cree gene and introduce the Cree gene into the progeny, then it cuts into this thing and the uh, progeny becomes artificial and then it is back. And so that, that is the outcome in terms of And this is what we did. When we express uh, a Cree, a transgenic, uh, you know, expression and created Cree protein that so the normal animals are just developing, you know, on the days of the first quarter, nine and a half, ten and a half, twelve. This embryo is growing normally, while the one where the accident has occurred at the exon eight, slowly just disappearing, and by day twelve or so, all of the male embryos are gone. Not a single male ever bonds to this complication, you know, in our first quarter. It's because, you know, without PDC, there, there is no function. There is no mitochondrial oxidation or energy production. So these embryos do not survive. Females survive. Some of the female embryos die, but most of the female embryos will survive because they have 2x and the X inactivation favors, you know, some of the survival and the animals will have. So this is the same male embryo on the day 10 and a half is already gone. It's, you know, almost at the time of death. And we can now identify this three allele, normal allele, which is 700 with exon 8. This two, you know, addition of the Fox sequences, addition of 100 nucleotide base pairs there. And then when this one is removed, the deleted allele only has the 400 base pair, you know, product. So based on this, you know, a genomic analysis, genotyping, we actually know which uh, genes are there, uh, you know, expressed in each of these, you know, uh, newborn mouse model. And th here is the, you know, one study that we did earlier where we express Cree only in the brain. You can express anywhere, in, you, know, you know, all of the cells in the mouse or you can take any specific organ. And we have done several combinations, brain only, liver only, heart only, pancreatic beta cells only and study its impact on each of these tissues and its metabolism. So here, and we have done in the entire body also, this is what happens in the human. It doesn't get knocked out in one tissue only, it gets entire body gets affected. So we have done all of those studies. But just to show you, you know, that uh, when you have, there is no male embryo born. There's no newborn male embryo. By the, the females out of you know 34, they should have been about the same number. Half of them died, but other half have survived because the degree of defect. Those who had severe defect, they are also died out in the embryonic stage. Those who had a mild form of deficiency, about 25 percent reduction in the overall activity, those female embryo have survived and born. And then th those are the females that we have in study. And as you can see, without going into great deal, both total activity and on day 15 or day 35 after birth has you know, decreased. 
and so is the active portion also relatively to the same extent is reduced. Uh, we can show that not only the activity but at the protein level there is a reduction in the protein activity and we can quantify in terms of, you know, uh, dense production analysis. If you look into several parameters, body weight is not affected because at 25% efficiency in the brain only, there is no effect in the uh, overall body, but the brain weight is <coughs> reduced, PDC activity is uh, reduced, glucose oxidation by the brain is reduced, and ability to convert glucose carbon into lipids that you know the developing brain does is also reduced. And then we can actually show in the, uh, by you know, histochemistry that in the brain there are some cells are normal, they have PDC, and the other cells are normal. This is, you know, 25% reduction in activity. It's not that every cell has 25% reduction. All it shows that 75% of the cells are normal and other 25% of the cells are not activity. And so we can actually document, you know, the normal cells, all the you know, histochemical, or, you know, PDH alpha in the mitochondria surrounding the nucleus of that. These cells are very little. So the efficient cell and the normal cells can be identified, uh, you know, the distribution. Now here are some, you know, other analysis in terms of histological analysis in terms of what happens at the level of cerebral cortex, you know, Parkinji cells and granular cells. This is all very preliminary studies that we have done. The postdoctoral fellow that came from Prague and got in my lab and uh, she had identified, you know, this initial observations. And now Dr. Plesbo has done and done some very extensive, very interesting analysis, not only in one part of the brain, but in various different the region of the brains have been you know, affected and she has you know, some very interesting observation to tell us sometime you know, later on when everything is together. So there's definitely there's a defect in the brain cellular structural levels are you know, modified. The same thing as I said that you know the defect lies in all tissues. So if you express three in all tissues, the PDH is knocked out simultaneously throughout the body. And so we also study to understand uh, as that what the might outcome be. Again, both in utero and in the postnatal period, the active activity is decreased, so is the total in the liver, heart, and skeletal muscle. Everywhere there is, you know, defect or reduction in the process. Later on, Mila went ahead and showed that, you know, there are definitely the changes in the structural level of the cerebral neocortex, corpus callosum, cerebellar cortex, and the Parkinson's itself that I showed you earlier. This uh, thing was reported in uh, 1930. She also was able to show that you know the development of you know by immunostaining uh, these uh, Parkinson's cells, you know, but, uh, on a uh, developmental scale, so the normal white type uh, Parkinson's cells are growing at a very you know uh, proper rate, whereas the uh, the Parkinson cells in the PDC deficiencies are really lagging behind in terms of the overall growth as well as the you know, uh, dendritic formation. Uh, we also did some labeling studies, and as you can see here, you may not be very able to see here. This is the normal uh, incorporation of the BRDU. There is very little, you know, incorporation. It's very very low might be able to see. But when we double labeling things, as you can see here, the yellow are the, the number of cells. They are doubly labeled with BRDU and, you know, neuron green cell. Here you see very few of them. You know. So definitely the cells are, you know, proliferation is really affected in these cells. Going back to, you know, the human things, you know, because the, the, there's no chance to do any of those studies that we can do. Uh, it's, it's in animals, but the magnetic resonance studies have been, you know, reported to show. And as you can see here, the presence of NNA and acetylaspartate and uh, uh, subject is markedly reduced compared to the uh, scan from a control subject. And we did the similar things with our animals. 
and we can show that that, that is the case. All right, and also the very similar changes in terms of you know accumulation of uh, lactate is low in the control in the PDC deficient mice it's increased and many of the other parameters NEA NAA is you know very low over here markedly in the over here so uh, our animal model is really showing some of the same you know characteristics that you know human patients are showing so one question is that that we cannot really fit modified diet to the uh, newborn mouse problem. it's so small and they cannot survive without the mother though we can do with the rat in my other program that is what we have done we have done taken the newborn rat pup away from the mother put the intragastric cannula in the stomach and now we can give any modified milk formula that we want to give and we have done over the last 25 30 years so we call it pup in a cup the model is pup in a cup it, it is the uh, pup is put into the cup and put it in the water bath it's completely away from the mother for the next you know, three weeks and it just grows normal thing we can give any formula and we give high carbohydrate formula but the mouse is the mouse pup is too small to do. that's very same thing though i would have loved to do it so we could not do that thing so we said okay how about that you know the things that happen the pdc deficiency doesn't occur after birth it occurs in utero at the start of the consumption you know the very first few days of life so why don't we give mother a chance to modify the availability of this so we put uh, this uh, mice on a high fat diet so when we bred the female mice we automatically put them on a high fat diet hoping that they will create ketogenic diet and ketosis in their environment and that will be transferred to the fetal life and the fetal brain can then use the ketone bodies and see what really impact is that and that's really the and we can see here that it has no impact on the level of pdc deficiency because it doesn't do anything that's a genetic thing so the, as far as the defect is concerned or the amount of activity it is reduced but the growth of the body is very normal and the brain activity this thing by you know is increased this is the mother on the child diet the, <coughs> the pop brain of the mother on the child diet uh, the mother eating high fat diet those fetuses and the new their pups are really gained the weight because they were you know provided this nutrient very early uh, in utero so that definitely that has done if you measure the activity, there will be no change because that genetically determined. But if you look at the structure, now structures are less impacted because the, uh, the, the nourishment was changed from glucose dependent metabolism. Now they have glucose plus ketone bodies, and ketone bodies have you know protected from any you know uh, stronger effect on the genetic thing. So as you can see over here. This is the control animal. This is the PDC deficiency on the left child. The mother was on left child, so definitely. This is the control mother on the high fat diet, and here is the control mother on the high fat. But this is the progeny. The progeny has been much better in terms of its you know protection uh, overall. So same thing in the cerebral cortex. You can see that there is improvement in terms of you know the uh, granular cells and the Parkinson's cell there. So they definitely even giving the mother, but it, that treatment is not applicable to a human. Because most of the PDC uh, defects are new. Mothers are normal. Sometimes mothers are carrier, but they are never actually identified as carrier until the male progeny is born. And then we know that the uh, male is affected, so we go back and study the family and we know that mother is carrier but she was never identified because she never ran into problem and that has been carried out from the grandmother we have gone through three generations but each time the female was protected because the unusual uh, x inactivation was in the favor of more normal than the defective outcome but when the male came then there was no choice for expression of the genome so the, the here is the, the very good example of that it does occur and can happen in vivo if you give the dietary treatment but yeah 
that would not, unless the mother has one sibling or, uh, that has you know, shown to be affected, and then if she has the second next pregnancy, she can be you know, promoted to give or take more fat in the diet so that it might be, you know, protect the embryo, and especially if it was a male embryo, that would be a very good treatment, you know. But that's very, very rare that you, you already know how the family a genetic background is. So in summary, PDC plays a central role in oxidation of glucose. That we know. And the brain actually depends about 100 grams of glucose is being oxidized every day to provide all the energy that the brain needs. And so any impairment in glucose oxidation, this is why whenever we become hypoglycemic, we fall on the floor. There's not enough energy to run the brain activity. Genetic defects in PDC components have been identified with varying degrees of clinical manifestation. Defects in PDHA1 gene localized on the X chromosome is the most common outrunner of any other genes in the same complex. The PDC deficiency results severe impairment in brain development and functions, and its mental retardation is the uh, expected outcome. It happens all the time. There are hardly any, yeah, I think we had one patient, one male patient, that was identified as a genetic defect, but I think he must have very, very mild defect because he went up to college. So it's almost behaved like a normal subject, but his genetic analysis showed that he had PDC deficiency. But most, uh, almost all patients are mentally retarded to a very degree of you know, expression. Complete deficiency of PDC is embryonic lethal, as we showed with the mouse model. That the male embryo would not be you know, born. PDHA1 knockout mouse model shows developmental abnormality in the brain but we still have to know a great deal of things that occur at the cellular level uh, because it's being expressed differently in different regions of the brain and what that association is in, you know, in connections. And Dr. Flesbord is, you know, I think, uh, the one in the position to, you know, really analyze this relationship between PDC knockout in various part of the regions and its impact on the function and the development of the various part of the brain. And for this reason, uh, this model is useful for testing novel drug because there have been no new uh, development of you know test or treatment for the last 30 years. The first time came, they say, okay, can I metabolize glucose? So give it 30 years. And we know a little bit about this you know four factor requirement, so give some vitamins. So everything is so easy to do it, and so the Clinically, this has been going on for 30 years. And now that we know that we can have the specific inhibitor for the kinase, which will be inhibited so that the residual activity will be more active, and that, that would be a useful approach to do it. And so this is the, you know, the initiative when Dr. Plesmore came to my lab. She started this new project on the new drug treatment in our butyrate, and we have some other candidates. So this is going to be a very, important and exciting way of providing new treatment in addition to high fat diet and vitamins. They all do little good, but they don't do complete. You know, a reversal of this thing. So if we can add another component which works independently from you know, uh, the protein side, then it would be extremely important. And so that's the part that you know I think would be a, a collaboration that will be going between your medical school and my lab. <coughs> So here are the you know, number of people. Uh, uh, there are two groups, as you can see here. Group on this side is the PDC group. Group on this side is the my other interest that is going on. Uh, this is the person Mila uh, that I mentioned earlier. She has done you know most of the work. Uh, this person you know uh, Korochitna. Luba Koroshitna came from Moscow. She was with me for 17, 18 years in my life. Came as a postdoctoral fellow, became assistant to us, and continuing on. She had done all the structure function relations and the things that I mentioned. She's really a, a great biochemist. Uh, others are, you know, postdoctoral fellow. 
this young lady also worked on the branch. She is a graduate. She came from Lebanon to my lab for a graduate uh, work, and then back there. And the other groups are, you know, the number of people from India, and they all work on the uh, the other projects of in a cup, as we call it, you know, maternal obesity or early uh, life dietary modifications. So. And as you can see their names, and uh, uh, this is a short list. As I say, I have over the last 40 years from 50 postdoc to 12 in my lab. And they have greatly contributed, and they have come from all over the world, you know. And the same is for graduate students. Not only that, I have a very good collaborative, you know, uh, activities with various members where I was, you know, uh, formerly a case based on reserve. Uh, also in the Buffalo Institute, uh, uh, and it is uh, Eva Caesar. She came from here, foreign native. She's in the United States. She's a crystallographer, and she developed a couple of structures on E1 and E3 of the component of this particular thing. So, and many others. I think uh, they are more on the uh, biochemical side. So, it, it has been a very pleasure to have this you know, interactive science, both in the United States and abroad, and having a great opportunity to have these young people coming from all over the world, getting their enthusiasm and dedication to you know, science, and working on various aspects. And they have made their career on their own. They have you know, done extremely well wherever they have gone, back to their native place or in the United States. So I am looking for for one more collaboration over here. Yeah. This thing here, medical school, and Dr. Ilana Lesboy it would be you know, a pleasure to continue you know to develop this you know a very fruitful and productive collaboration. So thank you very much for. Thank you. We learned uh, a lot about PDC deficiency now, and uh, we see it is located in global science, as, uh, as it is uh, shown here. So, if we have any questions, comments, please, it's kind of our friends. Before you do, I'd like to formally thank Professor Morris for the invitation, uh, Dr. Klaus Borg for enough. Uh, also invitations and taking care of all the formalities for our visit and the, the your uh, with you the discussion this morning and getting more information about this university so yeah i just want to make it a formal note that you know, i do appreciate you know both my wife and i appreciate you know your warm welcome and the hospitality that we have been enjoying and will enjoy for the next few days i will stay here for your kind words. Yes, I see that Professor Tomic has one question. Andrew Tomic. Well, top of the department, former, former chief of the department of laboratory medicine. And uh, I will tell you, there is a, there is a partial deficit. Oh, yes, you can just survive without PDH at all. Okay, so this flow to us in the is pretty precious, generally, even if it is insufficient. Okay, if you apply ketogenic diet to the normal animal, okay, then the flow in the brain at least through PDH is decreasing. Yes. Yeah? And you know, finally you have a, if you if you try to in, in vitro uh, as, to produce as other from other, other, other day and then from pyruvate, they take it together, they never give you the, the soup. Okay, they always have it. Yeah. So my question is, how the application of ketogenic diet, of course not to the humans, but you know, to the animals, uh, affects this, this uh, residual flow by the supraeurodegenerative system? Is it suppressed or not? Of course, the, the advantage of getting additional okay, from ketones okay, may, be prevail, may prevail when shown suppression of the age. Good questions. You know, I think acetyl CoA formation normally occurs from pyruvate metabolism under normal conditions. When we have defect, then that uh, rate of production decreases, so we have lower 
level of PDC activity, whatever the residual activity, and even part of that is only in the active form. So when you give a ketogenic diet, ketogenic fat metabolism suppresses or inhibits PDC under in all cell types, especially in the lymph node and muscle. This is how we have a group of sparing effect when we are on the high fat diet. But the brain does not get really fatty acid as such in the brain cell. It's the ketone bodies because they are water soluble, they go in, but their metabolism by generating acetyl CoA from ketone body oxidation in the brain may have an impact on the PDC activity because that's it. Acetyl CoA and NADH are the two end product inhibition through kinases. I didn't tell you the story, but there's you know the whole big story how these small molecules are that really playing the role how the kinase and the PDH are interact. So that it does inhibit, but at the same time it provides much better source and plentiful source of acetyl CoA from ketone body metabolism. And the overall effect is a better outcome. You know, so though it inhibits PDH, whatever the residual activity is there, some of that will be inhibited, but in, despite of that thing, ketone bodies are providing much higher level of acetyl CoA source, and this is why one sees a better outcome. You know. So that is the implementation. You know. Okay, what is what another dangerous manipulation? Mm -hmm. Glutamate. Yes. Uh -huh. As you know, there is individualized spirit well by glutamatergic particle in neurons, okay? So if you give the glutamate, if you increase the right glutamate, I know it is the better, okay? But we may provide uh, through glutamate glutamate the hydrogen to KDH, you know, to the second part of the trigger side. Yeah. So glutamate is you know the source, but uh, uptake of glutamate and level of glutamate is normally are very high in the brain anyways. So nobody has tried glutamate and it would not really interfere with the PDC reaction. Okay, it doesn't go through that. Glutamate will be transaminated to alpha ketoglutarate and then alpha ketoglutarate will get into the TCA cycle and will go forward direction. But then it will have one cycle it will get some benefit, but then it generates four carbon compounds, mm. which has to be then disposed of, and there's no system, you know. So then the whole system has not really worked, or at least theoretically, if one doesn't see any benefit uh, by giving glutamate as such, you know. Branch and amino acid, branch and amino acid would be a good thing, where yeah. they provide acetyl CoA, and, but then the uptake of all these amino acids, by the brains are somewhat limited. Yeah. So that it, it's not a major source of energy, you know. We need grams and grams of quantity, 100 gram of glucose that adult human brain uh, really oxidizes per day when we go on fasting for weeks and weeks, like, you know, these people go for a very long fast, their glucose metabolism, metabolism goes down and the ketone body level goes up and the brain still get the same amount of energy, but it's predominantly from ketone bodies and much less from the glucose. You know. So these compounds are taken, they are present in the blood at very high level, and it's readily taken in the blood cell. Amino acids would not be able to put in that, you know, quantitative. What about catabutyrate? <laughs> that will have the same limitation or some other complications, you know, because then you just drain all the, the uh, available amino groups for, for transamination from other amino's. They can be tried, uh, you know, maybe a good experiment to the stage for the right is to see what happens. So I wanted to learn the interesting part here was finally the butyrate yeah, yeah. as, uh, as a substance which could influence on PDC efficiency. It's uh, orphan drugs drug in fact for specific ammonium uh, disorders. Yeah. So how was it discovered that it can influence on PDC? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. We have a good insight into that. Genal bitterate is not a new compound of clinical practice. When the genetic defect is in urea cycle enzyme, ammonia gets really uh, accumulated. That cannot be converted into formation of urea. And so hyperammonemia is the you know uh, condition from 
uh, genetic defects in urea cycle enzyme. So there are alternate ways for disposal of uh, ammonia has been you know, investigated and actually practiced for now, several decades now. The, one of the idea is that ammonia gets you know, incorporated for the formation from alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate, and the glutamate is converted to glutamine by using another ammonia, but you cannot get rid of glutamine from the body. So you cannot get nitrogen out. So what they do is give a compound that will uh, conjugate with glutamine, which is the phenyl butyrate or phenyl acetate. So that's a toxic compound, phenolic compound. It's a, not a natural compound in the body. So when you give the patients phenyl butyrate or phenyl acetate, it is being converted in the liver cell as phenyl acetyl CoA. It conjugates with glutamate and then the uh, an acetyl phenyl glutamate gets cleared out by the kidney, then you got two nitrogen out. So it's almost like urea synthesis, but now it's the same way as I mentioned earlier, DCA, dichloroacetate is the compound which is the inhibitor of kinase, known inhibitor for 30, 40 years now. But it's a toxic compound. So this is why it's not used for a long-term treatment. So phenyl acetate is the derivative of dichloroacetate. They are all the very close compound like pyruvate. Acetate is the product of pyruvate and the modified acetate molecule is the you know one that might fit into the kinase you know binding site and might be an inhibitor. So DCA, uh, DCA is the very nice compound that binds into the ATP binding pocket in the pyruvate, uh, this PDH kinase. The same principle somebody thought that why not we use phenyl acetate? Phenyl acetate is a little more toxic and not very good. So you give phenyl butyrate, it get metabolized to phenyl acetate, mm -hmm. and then it can bind to the, you know, fit into the pocket as phenyl acetyl CoA mm -hmm. into the, uh, the kinase pocket, and then it inhibits. And it has been shown with the fibroblasts and all kinds of cells, but they never been shown into human up until now, mm -hmm. because the, those studies, uh, you know, the trials needs to be done but there is no animal experimental basis to approve that kind of use in the human, especially for the brain metabolism. So our studies are the you know, first step in that direction. If we can show that the treatment with phenyl butyrate to our PDC deficiency a, a mouse model and the brain gets you know, modified and gets you know, less detrimental effect and better outcome from Dr. Clark's first uh, finding, then that would be the you know, indication that there is a need for human trial. And so the NIH is looking for some kind of a basis to do the human trial. And our animal experiment is the first link to that. If we can show that this works in animal, in the developing rat brain, just like the human brain, that there is no toxic effect, but actually a better outcome, then there is a you know, reason to do a small trial. And so that, you know, as soon as this thing is published, it would have a very, you know, uh, impact in terms of, you know, initiating human studies. So that, that is the first priority. And then there may be some other drugs will come, other molecules. You know. We are developing something and uh, everybody is looking for uh, inhibitor of pyruvate kinase. It's linked to obesity, diabetes, the same problem. In obesity, it's activated. In diabetes, it's inhibited because of the kinase. And if you inhibit the kinase, your glucose will not be backlogged and increased. Glucose will be metabolized. So if you can find a good inhibitor for kinase, uh, you, can, you can really be very famous. There is a compound neutralization of the acetylcholine metabolism in the brain. So it's one that will be probably permanent. You are approximately the same age. You remember Dutch yeah. investigator who first did decompartmentalization of acetylcholine. It developed from the different rates of pyruvate metabolism in different types of the cell. So, yes. Of course, neural cells are dying because they have highest energy demand. With kind of How do we make PDH in different types of viral cells in this, in this, uh, in the, in the deficit? Is it proportionally decreased or perhaps you know, you know, on another level? 
I don't have the data. We just do the general, you know, things. I think what uh, I was uh, hearing this morning, you know, just the summary. But the platform has a real, real interesting data in terms of, uh, you know, uh, impact of PDC deficit in different parts of the thing. And what we are referring in are known as two compartmental analysis of acetate and pyruvate or glucose metabolism, because there are two types of cells. There's a neuronal cells and glial cells. And they talk to each other and they uh, synthesize glutamine in one compartment and send it to the neighboring uh, cells. And they convert that to glutamate and glutamate goes back. So glutamine glutamate cycle and the acetate contribution that comes either from glucose or acetate is very cell specific, you know. So that, you know, uh, you know one of the things that we will look into is the PDC deficiency in this glial cells and neuronal cells where neurons have different degree and the correlation would be extremely important. No, but if, I am just, if, if the impact, the genetic impact is the same, proportional, the same neurons and in this, you know, I know that the glial cells have the half of PDH activity uh, which is present in the neuronal cells, okay? But if you have deficient PDC, in neural cells, you have, let's say, 60% of normal activity. What about glial? 80% of it. Perhaps it's a post-translation modification of different types of neurons. Okay, so it may be different kinds of... Yeah, but the that analysis needs to be done. We haven't really shown in terms of you know, cell-specific deficiency. We just measure <laughs> no, overall... It's not going to help too much to neurons, of course. But, you know, yeah, but I think it, it, it would be more uh, affected, neuro more depend on the glucose oxidation. So they have a high level of mitochondria, yeah. so that is, you know, one of the expected thing. But, uh, that needs to be in this much more, you know, uh, in-depth analysis that we haven't done so far. All the yeah. our preliminary evidence shows that this mouse model shows some of the same clinical deficiencies in the brain as has been reported in the tumor. But the in-depth analysis had just begun. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some plans, you know, mm -hmm. Dr. Klesber has, you know, said. Uh, so I hope that, you know, this will continue and we'll get more specific, you know, cell type uh, uh, defects, you know, mm -hmm. both in the mouse matter and maybe eventually that knowledge can be applied to him or better treatment, at least. Mm -hmm. Professor Wolfgang Patel, indeed will be in our university to Wednesday, so Wednesday to Wednesday, yeah. somehow. And so there is still a place for such beautiful considerations uh, together with him. And uh, now I would like to say thank you once again. Thank you.